Okay, I'm going to talk about an essay by Jacob Bernowski called The Reach of the Imagina the Reach <clears throat> of Imagination. Um, it's a beautiful essay for critical thinking, um, and it kind of uh, uh, complements what Asimov said in his essay, The Eureka Phenomenon. Um, the essay basically is about what distinguishes, what's unique about human beings compared to other animals. And Asimov's answer, I mean, uh, Bernowski's answer is that it's imagination. <clears throat> and what is imagination? Imagination, he says, is the ability to manipulate uh, images in our mind, to play with images. And uh, the, the, the uh, images in, involve not only pic, pic, picture elements, but um, <clears throat> words to, to have symbols in our mind and to manipulate them, to hold on to them, play with them. Uh, he starts out with his uh, uh, a description of an experiment in 1910 by Walter Hunter, who was a uh, behaviorist uh, in, the, in the line of Pavlov, you know, condition, the condition reflex. He did an experiment where he had uh, dogs and they would have, it would be three, tr three t uh, tunnels and the dog would be facing three tunnels and uh, through a stimulus response, three re reward when the dog would get it right, uh, he would be, re the dog would be rewarded. <clears throat> it would teach, uh, the experiment would teach the dog to, uh, to go down the uh, tunnel that had the food. Uh, every time it went down the tunnel that, with, that had a light, if it went down that tunnel, it would be rewarded with food. And so through conditioned reflex, over a period of time, whenever the dog saw the light of the three tunnels, the, the tunnel that had the light, the dog would go down that tunnel and get the food. And that's simply now. And then Hunter, what he did, <clears throat> um, as uh, Bernowski says, he was very uh, imaginative, very creative. He, what he did is he added a, an element of time to the experiment. So he didn't, when the dog saw the light, he wouldn't let the dog go down the tunnel. He would wait, he would let some time go by and to see if the dog could remember the light. And with the dogs, they can only remember for about five seconds. Um, and, you know, whereas human beings, little children, they can remember for, uh, for way, you know, for months, hours, years. I mean, if you, uh, so the, the animals, dogs in this case, could remember only a fraction of, this, of uh, what human, human beings could remember. Uh, when it comes to chimps and so on, they can remember long, more, longer, than dogs, but even at the most, for them, it might be, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever. Human beings, though, we could remember, I mean, just imagine if you saw a light and you saw, you know, say it was tunnel three and you saw a light, you just remember, okay, number, uh, door number three, right? And you could hold on to that. And remember, five years later, they could say, well, well, what tunnel was it? And you say, well, door number three. What allows human beings to do that? And, and Bernowski says it's because we, have, we are able to symbolize our experience. When we see the light, we could tell ourselves, we say, we have the number, number three. Tunnel number three, and we, we, that's a, a symbol in our mind, a word. And we hold on to that and we play with it, manipulate it and uh, hold on to it. And so you could remember things for after years, whereas a, a dog's animals, maybe five, 10 minutes. So that's what uh, Asma says is that the key to human imagination. What distinguishes human beings is we have this ability to manipulate symbols in our mind. Imagine somebody like Shakespeare. I mean, where does Shakespeare, how can Shakespeare write these plays? Hamlet, Othello and stuff. I mean, he, he, in his mind, he has this ability to manipulate these symbols in the most creative way. So um, 
it's the ability to manipulate symbols that opens up Bernowski says a future to us it allows us to imagine you know a multitude of possible scenarios of possible worlds so human beings <clears throat> we have we don't just have one life we have many lives because we imagine all these different scenarios and possibilities and in our imagination we live those lives he gives the example of playing chess when you play chess you're not just playing the game that the actual moves you're making what's really going on a chess game if you is you can't see it but it's all the when a chess two chess players are playing actually many games are being played at the same time because in the in the the minds of the chess players are imagining all these possible combinations. Uh, Bernowski says, uh, you know, the old adage, a cat has nine lives, right? Well, you was like, wow, that's cats. They have nine lives, you know, it's in the, the way that the adage is usually interpreted, you know, we only have one, but cats have nine, nine lives. But Bernowski turns it around, turns that image around and says they only, only have nine lives. Human beings have numerous lives. No, nine is nothing compared to the amount of lives human beings have because of our ability to create worlds that do not exist, that we imagine. And we do that through our ability to manipulate symbols. He gives the example of Galileo, it's very interesting. Everyone knows about the experiment where Galileo, you know, the Aristotelian view was that heavy objects fall faster than lighter objects. And so the, as the story goes, you know, one day Galileo climbed up the steps of the Tower of Pisa and performed the experiment and dropped a heavy object and a light object. And lo and behold, the heavy object, they hit the same time. They didn't, the heavy object didn't hit first. That was a great, uh, great uh, experiment. But as Bernowski points out, uh, that experiment never happened. Galileo never walked up to the top of the Tower of Pisa. He did walk up it metaphorically. He walked up the tower in his mind. It was a, it was a thought experiment. He was sitting in his study and imagining walking up to the top of the Tower of Pisa and imagining dropping two objects, one heavy and one light. How could he do that? Because he has symbols he has that he can manipulate in his mind. He could play with these symbols. He, can, he has a symbol of the heavy object and the light object. He imagined connecting them with the string. He says that it basically it's a form of the argumentum ad absurdum, the argument to absurdity, which is the way it works this way. And this is it's the argument to absurdity is itself <clears throat> a great creative uh, accomplishment of human beings who can reason using symbols. Animals could never come up with thought experiments because they don't have the ability to manipulate symbols. But what Galileo did is he imagined walking up to the top of the mount of, of the Tower of Pisa and, and connecting one heavy object and a light object with a string. Okay, now he the thought experiment goes this. He, uh, he says, let's assume that Aristotle got it right, that heavy objects fall faster than light objects. Okay, well, let's see what follows from that. Well, what follows from it is that if, this, uh, if you drop these two, the heavy object, well, if you just drop the heavy object without this one, the heavy object itself would fall faster than these two because when you connect the heavy object to the light object, the light object is holding the heavy object back. It's making it go slower. Imagine a car going 60 miles an hour driving, you know, followed by a car only going 30 miles. A 30 mile car is holding it back, you know, it's impeding its speed. So, <clears throat> The, these two objects will fall, this one will fall faster than these two objects taken together because this, the light object is slowing this one down. On the other hand, he says, you can think of these two objects as one object 
connected with the string, and now both of them taken together are heavier than this one alone. So actually, both of them taken together will fall. This will actually, this one will now fall slower than these two taken together because these two objects seen as a single object is heavier than this one. So this will fall faster than this. On the other hand, it, it, let, it will fall slower than this because this is slowing it up. So what Galileo concluded was that Assuming that Aristotle was right, that a heavy object falls faster than a light object, the implications are that these two, uh, these two with, connected with the string will fall faster and slower than this. And that's absurd. Something cannot fall faster and slower than something at the same time. That's an argumentum absurdum. So therefore, the conclusion is objects, whether heavy or light, fall at the same speed. There's no contradiction. So that's how you resolve that contradiction. Uh, he also gave the example of, of uh, so that was uh, Galileo, and then he also gave the example of uh, Newton uh, when he, this, he had this Eureka experience uh, discovering, you know, where he, he uh, discovered gravity, where he was, um, he, he was sitting, as the story goes, he's sitting under an apple tree and the apple falls. And he got this Eureka experience and he saw, he said, I guess it. The apple is like the moon. The moon is like the apple falling, but it's so it's falling so fast that it got caught in the earth's in the in gravitational attraction of the earth. So the moon is now just going around and around and around the earth. It's like the apple falling straight, but it's caught in the earth's gravitation. Now that is a leap of the imagination. And then, uh, which, uh, uh, and Newton could do that because he was able to manipulate symbols, the symbol, he, he could think of the apple. He could think of, and hold that image in his mind and, and then make the comparison, the apple is like the moon. Now, uh, animals can't do that. That's an amazing leap of the imagination. And he was able to do it because of his symbol, his the, because the human mind can play around with symbols. This is also true in the arts. I mean, uh, Shakespeare, great writers have this ability to manipulate, play around with symbols they, and create great works of art. What, uh, what Bernowski says is that when you do this, and the what the mind does through manipulating the symbols, what happens occasionally is that these what it imagines actually corresponds to reality, and that leads to this, as Asma would call it, a eureka experience. Uh, so, you know, when when uh, again Newton is thinking of the the apple as a moon, you know, that's it's imaginative. Uh, accomplishment, but is it true? It is true. So what happens is that it it's right. I mean, what the mind imagines actually describes reality, and that you get the sense of, of it's that's it. It's I got it. And Asma says that's what happens with great literature. A lot of great writers, uh, people can become become very famous, you know, for a few years, but then they die out. These you never hear about them again. But the great writers, people like Shakespeare, Dickens, Proust, their manipulation of symbols actually gets it right, actually describes our human experience and deepens our understanding of what it means to be human. So that's a beautiful essay. <clears throat> And I think uh, it's what basically the, the lesson of Bernowski's essay is that the human mind, what accounts for this great creative, critical capacity of the human mind to think critically about the world and to make discoveries is ultimately rooted not simply in some mechanical, deductive, methodical type of reasoning, but in our ability to manipulate symbols. And that ability is what characterizes the great scientists, the great poets, the great writers. It's a Bernowski's essay, The Reach of Imagination, 
If you've never read it, read it.